The Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Joe Blatt. I'm the faculty director of the uh, Technology, Innovation, and Education program here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to our forum on um, Classic College Meets Online Opportunities, the Wither the Future of Higher Education. It's terrific to see uh, uh, colleagues and, and students and friends here, and also terrific actually to see a lot of people that I don't recognize. So it's clear that this, uh, this forum has drawn um, interest from across the university and I hope across the, uh, the, the community actually as well. And I want to begin uh, just right first by uh, acknowledging um, my wonderful colleague uh, Judy McLaughlin, the faculty director of the higher education program here at Harvard, who's my uh, co-host for the forum uh, this evening. And uh, in not too long, uh, Judy will be uh, introducing you to uh, one of our distinguished um, guests, uh, Chris Nelson, the president of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. And before that, I'll be introducing you to Bill Pepicello, the president of the University of Phoenix. But before we do that, I just want to take two minutes and say a word about the, uh, the genesis of, of this uh, forum, because it really has um, two roots. Uh, one is it's, it's an extension, direct extension, of a series of uh, symposia and conversations that have been going on here at this school, mostly among faculty and doctoral students over the last several years on the future of learning, on trying to look at what we see as some of the big trends that are really changing the world in general and the world of education in particular, including um, globalization, our growing knowledge of uh, the mind and the brain through neuroscience research, and digital information technology, how those three powerful forces are reshaping uh, education. Uh, Chris Deedy, uh, Jenny Thompson, uh, Kurt, Fisher's probably, uh, Kurt Fisher, uh, and I have been uh, co-leading that conversation along with several other colleagues who uh, couldn't be here uh, this evening. And we really wanted to focus some of our attention on the future of higher education, because after all, that's the business that we're in uh, here on this, on this campus to some degree. But the other uh, genesis is, is much more personal, and I just want to say a word about that in hopes that um, some of you may resonate uh, with my own um, experience, my own thoughts. I was fortunate enough to grow up with a pretty strong uh, classical education, a good sustained uh, exposure to uh, the great works of uh, Western tradition, and with uh, wonderful teachers who really nurtured in me uh, what turned out to be a lifelong appreciation for art and history and, and literature. My career, though, has focused uh, mostly on uh, what I hope is more or less the cutting edge of media and technology uh, as a producer, a researcher, and now as a, as a teacher uh, here. And um, in that are uh, arena, I've been focused on some very different things, very uh, different means of learning, means of learning that are largely visual and highly interactive and often online. Uh, of looking at, at really different skills, uh, things like um, the uh, collaborative construction of knowledge or the idea of teaching for understanding rather than teaching for remembering uh, bodies of, of, of disciplinary knowledge. And with a pretty different focus, with a, with, with a concentration in my own work anyway on um, contemporary science, especially uh, advances in, in neuroscience and, and, um, and contemporary challenges like what's happening with the environment and what's happening uh, with global interchange. So for quite a while, I've been pretty acutely aware of something of, 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 of attention about trying to how to figure out how to reconcile my two commitments, one to sort of the, the best of the wisdom of the ages and the other to the excitement of the future and what uh, possibilities are for new and in innovative uh, things there are. And uh, so I thought, well, I better get some help to try to understand that. And I thought, well, to terrific places to get help would be the two, what I would almost uh, offer as icons of the two uh, poles of this, of this tension. Uh, one, the foremost uh, example of a university based around uh, online and distance uh, learning with an emphasis on career and professional development and a for-profit uh, business model. The other uh, a canonical example of a, of a liberal arts traditional college where uh, learning takes place largely in intensively focused uh, seminar uh, settings and, and, and discussion groups. In fact, if you really want to um, just get how, uh, how quickly you can sense the difference between these two institutions, just look at their home pages. Here's the University of Phoenix. And as you I hope you can read there under uh, it's time to earn your degree, it says just a community of, join a community of learners earning a degree to keep pace with a changing world. 
And that sounds right to me. That sounds really important. I like the idea of a learning community. I like keeping pace. I like the idea of uh, being in tune with uh, a changing world. But then I also look at the homepage of St. John's College in Annapolis, and I see teaching, uh, you know, a, a, an engaged conversation with uh, the great books and the great thinkers of all time uh, in this uh, setting that's, uh, that's uh, really organized around deep, thoughtful discussion, facilitated and enhanced, hopefully, by, uh, by good teachers and, and faculty. And so that seems right to me also. So I'm really thrilled that uh, we're going to be able to bring this uh, dialogue to life here tonight, that we're going to have the right two people to uh, shed light on what these institutions uh, may have in common, and as well, I hope, also in ways that they may be quite different, so that we'll have light and possibly some, some sparks. Um, so it's, um, it's my pleasure, then, to uh, start this, uh, this dialogue uh, by introducing um, uh, Bill Pepicello, who has a PhD in linguistics from Brown, but I've learned also studied uh, quite a bit here at Harvard and um, MIT when he was doing his doctoral work. He then uh, went on to become a faculty member at the University of Delaware at Temple and at the University of the Pacific, and during that time published uh, research on classical languages, linguistics, psychology, anthropology, folklore, and humor, and I can say that the humor hasn't gone away. I've already experienced that uh, he's still working on that. Um, but then in 1995, he came to the University of Phoenix as the first dean of the College of General and Professional Studies, and then went on to become vice president of academic affairs. Took a couple of years off to uh, look at other uh, institutions, but was lured back to Phoenix in 2002 as the founding dean of the doctoral school uh, there, and then became vice provost for academic affairs, and eventually uh, provost. So with that history, I think it's fair to say that in a very meaningful sense, uh, Bill Pepicello is the University of Phoenix, and they recognized that in uh, 2006 by appointing him the sixth uh, president of the University of Phoenix. So we're delighted to have with us the president of what is, in fact, the largest private university in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Bill Pepicello. Thank you very much, although from the introduction you make it sound like I can't hold a job. <laughs> On the other hand, in case you wonder what happens to people who graduate from institutions like St. John's with uh, fine degrees in the liberal arts and classics and linguistics, <laughs> some of us go on uh, and, and actually uh, uh, do have other careers. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here this evening. Thank you for the, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a delight to be able to, to talk with you. I think you'll find probably our discussion tonight will be less of a debate than it is a discussion of some of the, uh, the common concerns that, uh, that face higher education. And uh, although we, that therein will lie the difference as we look at the, the different perspectives that we take in, in looking at the, the landscape of higher education today. And just for those of you who, who are natives here, and I can tell from the way you're dressed, there are a number of you, it's very cold here. Uh, but what I'd like to start with today is, is a reference to uh, the January-February issue of, um, of EDUCAUSE uh, Review uh, Journal, if you've had the chance to see it. It's very interesting. It's about the future of higher education. Um, and I think it's a good point of departure because it, uh, it's a view that comes from inside our current infrastructure in higher education in the United States. And in there, and, and I, I reference that, uh, that journal simply because given the sensitivity uh, to plagiarism today, if I make any references to it, so be it. <coughs> you can get it and look and you can see where, where I've quoted, although I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, to give uh, the, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, attestations as we go through. But in there, uh, Tapscott and Williams uh, have an article about innovating in the 21st century, and they say it's time. Well, yeah, um, but I think if we're going to talk about higher education in the United States, before we look at the 21st century, we need to think about coming out of the 19th and the 20th centuries, <clears throat> and, and then we can talk about what's happening in, in the 21st. Uh, they talk about the fact that newspapers and record labels are in collapse, which we all know is true, 
And they note that higher ed is losing its grip in some ways as the internet becomes the dominant infrastructure uh, for knowledge of all types. They note that uh, we need to toss out what they call the industrial model of education and that we need to replace it with a much more collaborative approach. The key here, they say, is infrastructure. And I think they're exactly right. And essentially, what they're saying is the current infrastructure will not suffice to sustain all of the progress that we need to make in higher education. Not that it's bad and must be thrown out, but that it certainly needs to be augmented. They claim that the, the, the future of higher education lies in reinvention, in a new infrastructure, and in a word, in change. And I think they're exactly right. We need to look at the old infrastructure in which higher education is by and large a cottage industry. It's one that is owned by the faculty who have the knowledge which we then pour into the empty vessels of our students. The new infrastructure, they suggest, and I think they're right, is one that is much more collaborative and one that is based on a technological infrastructure. And we'll talk about this a little more as we go forward. The bottom line is that we do need to get rid of the cottage industry mentality of higher education because knowledge is no longer in our professors. Knowledge is everywhere and we need to be able to manage that within the structure of higher education if we are to keep pace with the rest of culture. In another article, Brenda Gorley, uh, uh, the article is entitled, is entitled Dancing with History, a Cautionary Tale. Brenda Gorley tells us that we must take a business approach to higher education. We must look at performance management. In short, she talks about accountability in higher education. She also talks about investment of resources, telling us that we should pay attention to trends and to environmental change. And in particular, tells us that technology will be the key going forward. And as she admonishes us in this way, I suggest that our response ought to be, duh. You mean higher education ought to respond like the rest of society? That it ought to have a technological base, one that is easily accessed and navigated by those people who want access to it? I think she's probably right. And she points out quite rightly that technology can provide access to information and knowledge, but that we must do so responsibly. In short, what she's talking about is the democratiz uh, democratization of education. And this is not revolutionary. We have already democratized many aspects of our lives through technology. Everything from how we do our banking to how we shop. Uh, I'm the perfect example. Everything that I'm wearing that you, that you can see, <laughs> I bought on the internet. And I love people at my bank. They're very nice people, but I don't want to talk to them. I, I want to cash my check. I want to get money. I need to make transactions. And, you know, if I get lonely, I can go in and talk to them. Um, but I think that's where education needs to go. There needs to be that broader aspect. Finally, Diana Oblinger uh, has an article there uh, which is uh, entitled, from the campus to the future. And it asks a series of key questions. And those questions are, how do we scale and ensure quality, which people ask me on a daily basis, which is not surprising with 450,000 students and half a million graduates. How do we lower costs? How do we become more flexible? And what would a new education experience look like? And I want to talk about all of those things uh, in just a moment. In short, Oblinger asks us about looking at innovations in a digital age and to consider how we would unbundle the current campus in the digital age. 
she asked a good question. She says, will, future, will the future look like traditional campuses or will it look like University of Phoenix and Capella? And I think we'll talk about that tonight. I don't think it'll look like either one. I think it'll look like uh, pieces of both um, and probably something that is, is one that, uh, that both worlds will acknowledge and be able to live in. We know that students demand engagement. They demand flexibility in resources, support, and flexibility in curriculum. Hoblinger uses the, the terms consumerization and commoditization of education as if they are foreign to higher education. If they are, I submit that they should not be. Why? Because those terms really mean democratization. They mean bringing education to those people who want and require access to it. And she asks if innovation is being introduced quickly enough and can it be scaled. And most importantly, she asks, what can we do to speed the translation of research into solutions? To that, I have a very short answer, and that is, in many instances, we need to stop doing research and do something. And I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But basically what it means is stop asking questions we know the answers to and implement those answers. So in short, we need to bring higher education from the 19th century to now. We have the means and we have the ability to make that happen. So let's talk a little bit about what I see the future of higher education looking like. First, there are key elements that we need to look at uh, as we move forward. The first is knowing who our students are. One thing we know about higher education in the United States today is that only 27% of undergraduates today represent that traditional undergraduate that we think of when we close our eyes and think about higher education in the United States. That is, those students who are at Harvard, Brown, a very well-known Ivy League school, in case you haven't read my, uh, my bio. <coughs> I did say my mother is very proud that I'm at Harvard today. My colleagues from Brown are not so impressed. <laughs> um, but we, only 27% of undergraduates today have that experience or, at, uh, or having the campus experience at uh, places like Arizona State, Ohio State, Harvard, Yale. Um, the other 73%, which I refer to as next generation learners, are a very different group. And in order to serve that group, we, know, we need to know who they are. What do they look like? What do they think? How do they think? And what do they need? We need to know what their motivators are. And we've done some of that research at the university. And we know what motivates this next generation of learners. And it's things like security for their family, the respect that comes from having a college degree, proving their doubters wrong, and becoming a role model for their children. And these are things that I hear frequently. We also need to know what the inhibitors are for these people. What they tell us is their inhibitors are that the environment that they enter now in higher education is frequently not challenging enough for them. Inhibitors are social aspects of learning which is something we'll return to as opposed to a, the, a, a more isolated approach. We also need to know other elements of this 73%. We know from our studies that they are relatively sophisticated consumers because they, like me, can buy all this on the internet. And I like to think that's not a simple task. They thrive on constant distraction it is not unusual for them to be on the computer, have music going, be making dinner, and talking with their families. Interestingly enough, the next generation does not expect that they have to know everything. They only have to know how to access the information at those times that they need it. 
So the baseline of information that we provide in higher education needs to be rethought. To the next generation, community matters, whether it's community with other students, whether it's community with faculty members, whether it's community with, um, uh, with alumni. We need to have that social aspect taken into consideration. And finally, as I was introduced from a as a person who has a, comes from a, a, a primarily online institution, although one which I should point out has over 200 physical locations in uh, 40 states uh, and several hundred thousand students at those. We need to understand that the next generation of learners doesn't make a distinction between physical and virtual learning. What they tell us is it's all the same to us. I want it when I want it, where I want it. Sort of like they're experiencing the rest of life. We also have to learn to adapt to learning styles and preferences of our students. So we have to take into consideration not only the cognitive, the academic skills of these students, but also the affective pieces of their learning. How do they feel about their learning? How do they feel that learning is affecting them? How do they feel that it's changing their lives? And perhaps most importantly, we have to provide heuristic guidance to students. And what in the world does that mean? It means that most or a large part of the 73% that I'm talking about come to us as first generation students, which means that no one else in their families has ever been to school, which means they don't understand the context for higher education. And let me give you an example which was driven home to me yesterday as I was coming here from Phoenix. Um, I travel a lot out of the Phoenix airport, and as a professional traveler, I really hate tourists <laughs> because they don't know how to travel. So imagine that you walk into an airport and you've never been in an airport before. How do you know how to get around? I can walk into an airport anywhere in the world, and I know how an airport works. I know that I've got to get the ticket, I know I'm going to go through security, I know a variety of things. But imagine you'd never been in one. How confusing, overwhelming, frustrating would that be to you? That's the same way higher education is for people who have no context. They need to know how to navigate the systems. It's often said that the real value of a bachelor's degree is that it teaches you how to navigate a very complex administrative system. And if you can actually schedule and get into that last class you need to get your bachelor's degree, that's why you earn a bachelor's degree, not that you have any great academic ability. The same is true for students who come to universities now. They need to be able to understand the system so that they can be successful in it. And those are not skills and abilities that we need to dismiss. They're ones that we need to really look at. So we need to um, then fundamentally shift the student and the faculty experience. So let's take a, a short look at, uh, at some of those key elements in, uh, in that experience and talk about the sorts of things that we need to think about going forward. First, <clears throat> we need to think about the basic infrastructure and the platforms that are going to provide students access to information. We need a, an instructional model that is data-driven and individualized. In other words, we need to learn about our students and tailor our systems to who our students are. We need to develop new academic environments and develop new content models and new objects for students in, in way of learning. And that sounds very highfalutin, but what in the world does that mean? It means for instance, that we have to be able to provide students access to content at a reasonable fee. At University of Phoenix, we're, we're well known for not having physical libraries. We don't have bookstores. The reason for that is everything is digitized. When students come to the university, they automatically have access to uh, almost a thousand e-books, which you would call textbooks. Um, but we don't call them textbooks because we we're not concerned with books and chapters, we're concerned with content. 
Uh, they have access to a library um, with uh, probably 20 million uh, different items that they can access. They have access to virtual simulations. They have access to virtual organizations that we build so our students can experience the real world in, in significant ways. We provide all of that at a cost per course less than the cost of one textbook at most traditional universities. That goes to the cost factor that we talked about earlier. We need to look at ways that we can develop content that is affordable and that is flexible. To give you another quick example, let's assume there are three basic textbooks that people use to, to take um, Economics 101. And we all know this, and depending on the professor you get, the professor picks one of those three textbooks. We have all three te textbooks digitized. So whoever's teaching that course can take content from any of those textbooks at any time and direct their students to them. So we're not bound by that, uh, that more traditional structure. So we need to look at that kind of an infrastructure. And lastly, we need to look at a student-centered learning platform. And what do I mean by that? I mean a platform that is pedagogy agnostic. It's one that deals in adaptive learning and one that adapts to, divi to diverse learning objects and diverse learning styles. And I'll talk about that in a moment. It also needs to provide individualized instruction. It has to have predictive delivery. It's a smart system. It's a system that knows who the student is. And importantly, we need to be able to map what we call the cognitive DNA of our students. The system has to know how students learn, how individual students learn, and adapt to that. And now, many of you are saying, what in the world is he talking about? I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody here ever buy anything on Amazon.com? All right, ah, good. When you buy whatever it is, let's say it's, you know, a piece of paper, do you ever notice that it then says, if you like this piece of paper, you may like boom, boom, boom. Yes, you get those. You know why? Because Amazon.com is a smart platform, and it learns about you every time you come. It knows all sorts of things about you. It knows what you like. It knows whether you're visual uh, in your orientation um, or uh, auditory in your orientation. So what I'm saying is that technology already exists. We just need to be able to adapt it to higher education. Some of our basics have to simply be rethought. Education can't be a cottage industry. It does have to be collaborative. Curriculum has to be tied not only to internal standards, but to external standards. When we develop curriculum, it cannot be exclusively the purview of the faculty because students go outside the faculty to see what the other anchors are in the curriculum. And in today's, uh, in today's world, they're more than willing to challenge a faculty member based on information that they can get somewhere else. Outcomes must be measurable, they must be transparent, and they must be consistent throughout the curriculum, which is to say, um, and I won't go into detail here, but we have an outcomes assessment system and a curriculum development system at the university so that I know that the outcomes that are being taught to in Seattle, Washington tonight are the same outcomes that are being taught to in Tampa, Florida and in my online courses. And I know how those outcomes are being assessed and I know what the results of those assessments will be so that we can tie that into a system of continuous improvement. All of this goes to accountability. We then have to rethink what I call technologically enhanced education, which used to be called online. But as I said, students don't care. They want access to education in the modality that they want it, when they want it. 
We have put together resource centers across the country at University of Phoenix that are designed to provide access to our online students. I'd like to say it was my idea. Well, I will. It was my idea. <laughs> but we had some very smart people who said, you know, I think that online people don't want to do everything exclusively online. They want to do most of it online, and they want to have access to face-to-face -face interaction when they want it. So we, we looked at zip codes of our online students and strategically placed centers where online students can come if they want to do things face-to-face. -face. And guess what? They come in droves for a variety of reasons because that's the way they, they view the world. Face-to-face -face when I want it, online when I want it. We also need to, to rethink some basic notions such as remediation. We know that remediation simply doesn't work in the United States. It's one of the great embarrassments of our system. And the reason is very simple. It's designed to fail as a system. It tells students, congratulations, you graduated from high school, not so fast, you're broken, we're going to fix you, and the way we're going to fix you is that if you're not good at writing or math, we're going to make you do it until you die or you get better. Well, guess what? Over 50% of them die. Boy, there's a success story. What we're looking at is a system of what we call just-in-time skills, which is to provide students the level of support they need in areas like writing or math when they need it. Why do I need to know how to do a quadratic equation in my first semester at, in college if I'm already bad at math? I need to know that when I take my statistics course. I don't need to know how to write a five-paragraph essay in my first writing course. I need to, write, to know how to write it by the time I get out. So what we're focusing on at the university is what we used to call remediation as skills development that goes on throughout the curriculum because the focus is how good are they when they leave? We know they're not great when they come in. What we've got to do is figure out how to get it so that they are good when they leave. So in, sh in short, we need to be thinking in platforms, and they need to be smart platforms that provide networks, networks of like students, networks of faculty, things like you look at in uh, areas like Facebook or LinkedIn, but contextualized for higher education. And the platforms need to recognize that cognitive DNA that I talked about. In short, we need to have a system that's transparent, that's accountable, that is accessible, and it mirrors the, the experience that our students have in the rest of their lives as far as virtual interaction. Finally, just a, a quick note about <clears throat> uh, where the for-profit uh, sector fits in here. It is, it is generally acknowledged, and it's true, that for-profit sector is, in general, more flexible, more responsive, and more innovative. Um, I don't take credit for any of that, except for the fact that in, in the for-profit world, we have the ability to redirect resources much more quickly than traditional higher education. We're not dependent on an endowment. We're not dependent on state funding. We are dependent on making smart decisions and being able to allocate those resources. So that's, that's important. But in order to, to do that in a way that helps the rest of higher education, we first have to redefine the sector of for-profit higher education. It's not a one-size-fits-all, although the government uh, and states and most of higher education looks at it that way. When I have to participate in uh, for-profit higher education conferences, I'm there with barber schools and dog grooming schools and truck driving schools, and there's nothing wrong with any of those schools except they're not regionally accredited. They don't have programmatic accreditation for five of their, uh, of, of their programs, and they're not approved in 40 states and we need to change that if we are to level the playing field so that we can share more of what we do with the rest of higher education. We need to be able to look at the models of outcomes assessment that for-profit higher education has that can be informative to the rest of higher education. Not that we're that great, but the government demands that we have these systems, so they're in place, and I think there's a lot to be learned there. 
the upshot of this is that we have to have the perspective that the funding source for higher education institutions is irrelevant. It's the outcomes that count. All of this then has to translate into responsible legislation that will, in fact, level the playing field for for-profits so that what we have can be more broadly uh, shared and partnered with in the rest of higher education. In summary, the, the technology, the expertise we need to address the future exists. Research universities such as Harvard have their place and they do a great job. And the innovations and the, and, and, and the advancements they bring to the world are key. And certainly, I'm talking primarily about the teaching aspect of higher education. But we need to keep in mind that higher education in many ways still is generations behind the rest of society. We have the ability to bring it here and I think as going forward as partners, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. This really is a fascinating conversation. The late Harvard sociologist, David Reisman, referred to the college university president as the living logo of the institution. And you said that Bill Pepicello was Mr. University of Phoenix. I'm delighted to have the doctor of university, excuse me. Um, absolutely. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Chris Nelson, who is the living logo of his college, St. John's College, Annapolis. Chris Nelson is an exceptional president in a couple um, meanings of the word exceptional. Let me start with the first meaning, which is truly outstanding um, in terms of performance. I meet a lot of college presidents in the course of my work, and I have my own impressions of them. But every once in a while, I have independent research on the performance of a president. And in Chris Nelson's case, I had a doctoral student about five or six years ago who was looking at a small group of presidents and decided to do case studies on their campuses, interviewing a large number of people to talk about the president and the work of that president. And this student came to me afterwards and said, I had a really hard time at St. John's College, Annapolis. And I said, you did? Why? And she said, I kept trying to get people to tell me about criticism and problems. And, and sure, they would name things, but then they would talk about how great Chris was. And they kept coming back to that. And she said it was so clear that he was admired and respected. There was enormous affection for him and appreciation for his leadership. And I kept thinking, what's wrong here? Um, so I have it on independent research that Chris Nelson is an exceptional president in that sense of the word exceptional. But he's also an exceptional president in the sense of an exception to the rule, unusual, not the norm. The average length of tenure for college university presidents today has actually risen slightly in the last five years. It's now eight and a half years. Chris Nelson has been the president of St. John's College in Annapolis since 1991. That's 19 years way beyond the norm. Most college presidents come to this job from higher education. Something like 40% have come through the academic arena, been academic deans and provosts and vice presidents, starting as faculty members, and so that academic administrative route. Another large percent are people who have been administrators within higher education in non-academic areas. And then there's a blend of people who have been at some point or another inside higher education, outside higher education. But only a very small percentage, about 7%, come entirely from outside higher education. Chris Nelson is one of those. That's the Mr. Chris Nelson. Chris Nelson was a lawyer before he came back to St. John's College, his alma mater, to be president. So although he is an outsider 
to higher education and was an outsider to the traditional trajectory to a college presidency, he was no stranger to the institution that he was asked to lead 19 years ago. He was an alum, he was a trustee, he was somebody who cared deeply about the place that he chose to come to as its leader. And now if the president is the living logo, certainly a president has to be able to articulate the vision of their college, as we heard Bill Papicello do, and I'm delighted to have Chris Nelson talk about a college about which he also feels very deeply. Thank you. Well, it sounds like the best decision I ever made was to say yes to your graduate student <laughs> when we uh, had those interviews on campus a few years back. It, uh, it won't surprise anyone that I will have a few different things to say, uh, a different answer to the question of what we should expect of higher education in the coming years in its future. Um, I imagine that there are many futures for higher education for the diverse group of institutions that constitute all of higher education. <clears throat> but I'm going to restrict my remarks to one kind of such education that will always have a future because it is timeless. And I'm speaking of a liberal education. Very simply, my argument goes something like this. Human beings are much the same in this century as they were in the last and in the many centuries before this. Thus, the be best education for what it might mean to be human and to lead the best human life cannot have changed in its fundamentals all that much. The most complete form of education serves this purpose, to help us come to understand the human condition in order that we might make for ourselves a life worth living. As important as the world of work is to us, we don't live in order to get a job. We work in order to make it possible to live a good life. So my answer to the question, whither the future of higher education, is that the future will always have room for an education in what it means to be human, irrespective of all the business modeling to find ways to deliver certain kinds of educational products to consumers. The education that's best for under understanding our place in the world and making the best life for ourselves must surely be tomorrow pretty much what it should be today. <clears throat> And I wish to make the case that men and women have always deserved a liberal education, an education in the arts of freedom, in order to accomplish their highest purposes and in order to achieve their greatest happiness. Freedom of the mind allows us to exercise the choices we have with care and deliberation, without the shackles of popular opinion or fads, without fear of the unknown, without slavish adherence to the will of others, and without the tyranny of our own ignorance. A study of the liberal arts, I'll argue, will be the best way to such a liberal education, and that a liberal education for the next century will look pretty much like it does today, because such an education is timeless and most fitting for the human condition. Let's remember that everyone is a liberal artist, whether he or she is formally educated or not because all men and women exercise their reason, however little evident this may be from time to time. <laughs> Robert Maynard Hutchins, the former president of the University of Chicago, put it well. The liberal arts, he said, are not merely indispensable, they're unavoidable. Nobody can decide for himself whether he's going to be a human being. The only question open to him is whether he will be an ignorant one or one who sought to reach the highest point he's capable of attaining. The question is short, in short, is whether he'll be a poor liberal artist or a good one. Let me put the question in an historical context. Consider that the earliest of recorded history dates back only a few thousand years. We frequently look to Homer as a progenitor of our literature. We understand that the Iliad may have been set to writing in the 7th or 8th century BC or some 2,700 years ago. And yet we still look to it for some of the greatest literary examples of honor and glory in battle, statecraft and leadership, heroism and cowardice, the effects of rage in war, and rage within a community of would-be friends, and the pain suffered and fury released over the loss of a friend. These examples are as familiar to each of us today 
as if we'd witness them now. Consider the books of Moses. We hear that Genesis may date back between 2,700 and 2,900 years, but it contains a story of religion, of, of origins that's contemporary to the years of many today and speaks to the relationship between the natural and the divine. The book gives us examples of love and betrayal, sibling rivalries, men's and women's uh, relationship to the Almighty, and their duties to fellow human beings, all of which raise questions which have a remarkably contemporary feel to them. Or look at the Book of Gilgamesh, the ancient Mesopotamian epic, which was said to have been reduced to stone tablets some 2,700 years ago. It tells a tale of heroism, the foundations of friendship, the pain of loss, man's desire for immortality, his attempts to achieve it, and his lesson in humility at the impossibility of defeating death. What about our basic humanity has changed in all these years? <coughs> So looking back at a few different civilizations, we imagine that recorded history is less than 3,000 years. Consider that Harvard has been around for 400 of those years, or roughly one-eighth the full length of recorded history. Or look at St. John's College, which traces its origins to 1696 and has been around for more than 10% of recorded history. Better yet, consider our own meager lives. I'm in my 60s. And I've already lived more than 2%, already lived more than 2% of the length of all of recorded history. It is a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's stunning uh, to imagine the relative youth of our race. And then I look within my family. I have a number of grandchildren, but one of them happens to be 2% uh, of the length of my life. And I think uh, of my grandchild and me as occupying the same world and having a common foundation for asking what it might mean to be human. <clears throat> and yet my life is in the same proportion to the life of the whole of human, uh, the human race in recorded time as the length of my grandson's life is to mine. So I've, I've had my fun and I made a point, I hope. I'd never demean the progress that man has made over the centuries, though there have been great regressions too. Sophistication and understanding in the arts and sciences have blossomed and flourished in recent centuries and in recent decades. Democratic forms of government have taken hold only in the last 200 years or so. Mankind's material productivity has grown astonishingly and every day there are new discoveries and new paths of learning that have opened up to us. The world grows more and more complicated and it becomes harder and harder to comprehend even a small piece of it. <coughs> Nonetheless, even in these complex times, any proper course of instruction in the liberal arts, the arts of freedom, should be designed to give us the tools to ask the question, who am I? The invocation here is the same as the words at the entrance to the temple of Delphi, consulted by Socrates in his youth, know thyself. It presumes that the question, who am I, is a real one, and that we ourselves have not answered it. It presumes that the stakes are high, that our happiness depends upon our investigation into the question. It suggests that coming to know oneself is a high and even sacred duty, <coughs> a task of some difficulty, requiring courage and worthy of being called heroic, as Socrates is called by many of our students at St. John's. By the way, I'm pleased to see a few of our students up from Annapolis here. Thank you for coming. And it suggests that the ways our students will choose to live their lives after they leave our colleges may depend on just how they go about answering the question, who am I? It's not a question left to any one or two or three of the so-called disciplines in our universities. It belongs to all of them. Consider the texts our students might study together in mathematics and science, in the humanities and the political disciplines, in the study of things divine or eternal, all of these books in any of their courses should help our students consider some aspect <coughs> of the question, who am I and what is my place in the world? What does that world look like? Am I a featherless biped or a rational being, a lover of wisdom, a political animal, a son of Adam, a child of God, a collection of molecules and a product of genes, an evolved kind of ape, an acquisitive animal, a noble savage, with a life that is solitary, 
brute, brutish, mean, nasty, brutish, and short. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. There we go. <laughs> Get my Hobbes right. But still created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. <clears throat> Those are just a few of the possible answers that our students might consider from their studies over the course of four years in a college committed to liberal education. Now, as much as we speak <clears throat> about the good of the liberal education for the individual, our liberal arts colleges also serve the public good. <clears throat> and we do this by helping to bring thoughtful adults into the world, adults who are free to think for themselves and free to choose paths of action they consider to be best rather than those that are easiest or most popular. This brings me to the question of public policy. Should we as a nation share, care whether a liberal education is available to the citizens of tomorrow? I think the answer is yes, but let me state the argument in a nutshell. Our nation's foundation rests upon the principle of the intellectual freedom of each of its citizens. Its political, economic, moral, and spiritual freedom are all derived from this intellectual freedom, and its political, economic, moral, and spiritual strength depends upon it. We're a nation built upon a respect for the individual and a trust that our citizens are capable of self-government. For the sake of our country, then, we need citizens to have an education in our democratic traditions and foundations, as well as in the arts needed to question and examine those very foundations so that they may keep them vibrant and alive for us against attack or atrophy. There's a real tension between these two goods. <clears throat> the traditions, customs, and laws of the nation are at times at odds with the very things that encourage the autonomy of the individual citizen who might question them. And this tension is healthy in a free republic. A college education that will strengthen this tension will serve the nation well because it will help us educate independent and self-sufficient citizens who will be fit for the freedom that they enjoy in our country. Providing the access and opportunity to as many as possible to undertake such an education will serve that public interest. If we prize the individual in our society and value the ways an individual can become self-sufficient, we also want to support the many and various means our colleges employ to help their students become independent and strong. In the end, independence in our citizenry will strengthen the country. Education in the arts of freedom and self-sufficiency make the promise of America possible. Now you'll note that I have not stated that a first principle of public policy ought to be global competitiveness in the marketplace, or financial supremacy, or military superiority, or international leadership in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that's because these things will follow upon any sound investment in the broader public policy that I've described. They're all good things, but they require that we acknowledge first the source of our historic strength in these areas, and that this strength comes from our commitment to a liberal education, which is prior to an education in workforce development. The human mind, uh, like the human being, is not compartmentalized into humanities, arts and sciences, or other specialties. We may have left and right sides of the brain, but we think with a whole mind. We should thus have concern for all of the humanities. The study of the humanities properly conceived is about the whole human project, and it crosses all those artificial disciplinary boundaries, including mathematics, the sciences, and the arts. The work of our colleges and universities ought to recognize the whole of their study and not just the parts. Our students should be asking what it means to be human in all of its many forms and should be studying both the whole and the parts for some period of their undergraduate education before they pursue a necessary area of particular concern requiring special expertise. The questions belong to us in our liberal arts colleges and universities. We are or should be taking some responsibility for seeing that these deeply human questions have a place somewhere in our classrooms and on our campuses. So what then would a plan of education look like that would attempt such a project? I'll give you just one plan that I know something about. It's the plan of instruction for all of our students at St. John's College, a plan that bears the simple name, the program. We prescribe 
a single course of instruction for the would-be liberal artist. Where others have shopping malls for universities, and the students are customers and the customers are always right, and the shoppers select from among countless offerings, purchasing the course load they want, we at St. John's have said that we think we know better than the typical 18-year-old what a good education is, and we refuse to flatter them and pretend that they know more than they do about what's best for their education. We can imagine that other faculties will make many other different curricular choices, but they should not give over the responsibility to design a strong curriculum for students who have yet to begin a college experience. Our students have four years of a language tutorial in which they study ancient Greek, modern French, and English and American poetry. They have four years of mathematics in which they do together the proofs and demonstrations, starting with Euclid, who first organized plane geometry into a system, uh, through Lobachevsky, who wrote the first non-Euclidean uh, geometry text. They read Aristotle, who wrote an early book on time and place, and Einstein, who helped us think about time and space in entirely new ways. They study the motions of the heavens from Ptolemy and Copernicus to Newton and beyond. They do three years of laboratory science in which they look first at the world about them and ask what they're seeing. They study chemistry and biology and ask what the organizing principles are of matter and of life before they proceed to the study of classical mechanics with Newton, quantum mechanics with Heisenberg, and the tools and texts of modern biology from Darwin to Watson and Crick and experiments in recombinant uh, genetics. They sing and learn the elements of music in order to be able to understand uh, the principles behind and to listen intelligently to Bach's St. Matthew Passion, Mozart's Don Giovanni, uh, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, and in order to grasp the power of music in communicating what a text cannot. And yet all this classroom activity revolves around the centrality of the four-year seminar, in which students read in roughly chronological order the books that were best known to read, from Homer and Virgil to Chaucer and Shakespeare, from Cervantes and Milton to Austin and Eliot, from Tolstoy and Dostoevsky to Wolf and Conrad, from Plato to Aristotle, Descartes to Kant, from the Hebrew Bible and New Testament to Augustine, Aquinas, Spinoza, from Herodotus to Thucydides to Tacitus to Hegel, from Hobbes and Rousseau to Lincoln and Douglas. Every subject is required of everyone, and all of it's difficult. We don't pretend to teach anyone how to think, but we give the students many occasions for exercising thought. The more it's done, the better it's done. We defend the search for truth, or at least avoid foreclosing the possibility of truth. You don't have to have the truth to believe it's there or to have some sense that one thing is better than another for a reason. For learning to take hold, the student must find some way to make the lesson his or her own. To make it one's own requires that something be at stake for the student. The student is driven then to ask not just what something means, but whether it makes any difference what something means. That is, whether it is true or not. We direct our students not to contemporary ills, and conflicting prescriptions for treating those ills, but to the fundamental texts that help us consider the human condition at its best and at its worst. We try to read the best books for all ages rather than those now in vogue. We think our students should consider the ideal before they pass over into the imperfect and the broken. Thus they ask what is good and beautiful and what's worthy of their love before they look at the fallen images of those things. We promote the desire to learn over the mania to test performance. Success in passing tests will follow the former as the night does the day. And therefore, we construct an academic program that encourages the desire to learn for its own sake rather than for the sake of the grade. This requires that we give attention both to the quality of materials that we use to teach from and our ways of giving them life in the classroom. We assign to our students matter that will be worthy of their love. After all, it's love that moves all of us to the good in the world, including the good that can be learned. Thus, our chief criterion for selection into the community is the desire to learn. If you have it, you can probably learn and help others learn too. Our students are a self-selected community of presumptive equals. 
We think that a college is a republic in miniature, a community in which the common good is considered and balanced with individual needs. We select our books as a community of teachers whom we call tutors. The selection criteria that guide us consider what is best for our students to be reading together. Our tutors teach across the entire curriculum so that they can properly serve as model learners for our students rather than experts. And so that any one of them can engage with any one of our students in a discussion about any aspect of their communal learning. When we have differences of opinion about what, should we, what we should be doing, we exercise reasoned discourse rather than power politics. We encourage in our students the freedom to be at leisure. Freedom requires that students have some time to look at, contemplate, and talk about fundamental questions. This requires that they get some break from the practical pressures, even from paid work, if possible. Student is time, uh, uh, school is time out for study. It's not just another job, another test, more work. And we try hard to avoid loading up our students with more and more work, which would just mean giving them less and less time for leisure in its highest sense. We encourage all opportunities for learning together, faculty, students, and staff. Learning is a social activity and a cooperative art. We thus support any number of ways to come together on and off campus to pursue learning together. We try to treat all community members, students, faculty, and staff as ends in themselves, not simply as means to our institutional purposes. This is obviously impractical at its limit, but it's nonetheless a worthy object of pursuit. We refuse to use the language of the marketplace. Our program of instruction is not a delivery system. Our students are not consumers, and liberal education is not a product that can be bartered going to the highest bidder. Socrates had it right when he reminded us that the power of learning is in the soul of each of us and cannot be put into us just as we cannot put sight into blind eyes. Learning actually requires commitment and effort on the part of the student as well as on the part of the school, which is a far more complicated activity than the purchase of goods. We're sometimes asked whether we aren't elitist. One former dean's answer to this was, well, we are small but we're about as exclusive as a pickup baseball game. If you have a glove, want to play, make an effort, you probably belong here. That's a pretty good image uh, because it suggests something that's very all-American. We're a model of an American institution in at least two respects. First, democratic participation is our primary mode in the classroom. Our students are responsible for participating in their classes, all of them in the same way. They must read the books, and they must learn to listen to the authors, listen to their classmates' contributions, and listen to themselves speaking. They have equal responsibilities, equal rights, equal opportunities to learn according to their abilities, their desire, and their preparedness for class. Second, all of our students read and read critically the principal documents that define our American democracy the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, Federalist Papers, great speeches of Washington, Lincoln, Douglas, and others, key Supreme Court decisions. Our students must practice the intellectual virtues to succeed at St. John's. Courage in the face of the unknown and the difficult, industry and persistence in preparing for class, and candor about their own shortcomings. I've been asked by some of my older friends why we'd waste such an education on the young. We do have a graduate institute, by the way, for all of you who'd like to enroll. But my answer to these friends is that we're prone to expect too little of our young. The sooner we recognize that students learn more when more is expected of them, the students achieve more when the bar is set higher, the sooner our plan for education in this country will improve to meet the needs of our citizens rather than simply cater to their desires. This is a program suitable for today and well into the next uh, millennium with adjustments along the way to account for what we will learn in our experiences with the program and for the new and enduring discoveries, productions, ideas, and works that will help us better understand the world we'll be living in, all for the purpose of preparing our students to live and flourish in the world that they'll be inheriting. Thank you.
we've just heard two fascinating and eloquent descriptions of two very different educational programs. And so we're going to take a, a minute or two to ask some questions up here and then want to bring you into the conversation. Um, so let me just start with a, a quick question. In admissions world, they talk about overlap institutions. If you're at Harvard, you might be applying to Harvard and Yale and even Brown. And um, if you're at Amherst, you might be applying to Bowdoin and Middlebury. I suspect that the University of Phoenix and St. John's College are not overlap institutions. That those are, are places that attract different kinds of students. And so let me just ask each gentleman quickly, what students do you think you do not serve well? Either one. I'll be happy to start. Um, given those students, maybe we don't want to just do this. <laughs> the students that we do not serve well are, at, at the moment, those, uh, those students who fall into that 73% that I talked about uh, that we know the least about. And that is there are, there are students who, for whatever reason, are, are struggling um, not only academically or cognitively, but affectively. They're, over, they're, they're overwhelmed by life forces. We, where we struggle with that student is knowing exactly what support systems we have to have in place so that in addition to providing access, which is a relatively simple task, we can take on the mantle of responsibility of saying, if we are going to provide you access, we also have to provide for maximum success. So there's, there's that part of that 73% that we probably do not really serve as well yet as we, uh, as we can, but we'll try to continue to, uh, to learn about them. Yeah, I guess I would say that the student we don't serve well is the uh, student who belongs somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, it may be the lazy student, it may be the student who finds, even while they're at St. John's College, something that they love and they want to pursue, but they can't because they can't major, they can't specialize, uh, and they need to go on, and we always say a little bit of a good thing is better than none at all. Um, but if you don't have the desire to do this program, you won't be well served. And so it's important for someone entering the program that they understand what's going to be expected of them, and if they do, I think we serve them well, and that would be students of all ages. We're obviously a much more traditional post-high school age college, but we do have a number of older students as well who come back, including parents of uh, graduates. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, we're just gonna cross over here. And Jim, why don't you do this? Well, I'll just ask one question. And, you can run to the and please, while I'm asking my question, feel free to start coming through the uh, microphones in the aisles of, um, to ask your questions, because really that's the main use we want to make of the 15 or 18 minutes that, uh, that we have. But <clears throat> I guess my question is about um, what, Bill, you referred to in your remarks as um, um, accountability or, or outcomes assessment, I think. Um, I have some imagination that, that among the measures that you look at at the University of Phoenix for success in outcomes is um, placement in careers, for example, but I'd like to, to know how you do measure the outcome. What is the outcome assessment? And then, Chris, I, I think that's a, in some ways a harder question given the sort of uh, qualities and attributes that you were saying that your um, system in, endows with students, but how do you have any idea whether that system actually does produce those virtues in people once they, once they leave the campus? Well, in, in our case, because uh, the majority of our programs are, uh, are, are focused on the various professions, what we have done is, is put in place a, a curriculum development process by which we use our content experts who are faculty who number some, give or take, 30,000 around the world um, to develop our curriculum in, uh, in concert with instructional designers so that when we develop a program or even a course, we can bring expertise from people who are working in the field. We design our outcomes to external standards, so they would be standards 
let's say, for nursing programs, of the nursing accrediting bodies, of engineering bodies. Um, you know, once we have a set of, uh, of outcomes that, and let's just take the programmatic level, uh, we can then, through our instructional design process, build those outcomes into the curriculum in ways that we can identify where those outcomes occur in the curriculum, what tools we use to assess those outcomes, and we assess every outcomes in a triangulated way. So every outcome has three different assessments for it. We can then track the, um, the result of that with students and then use that, the results of, uh, of student performance to then inform continuous improvement. And so that is the, the outcomes assessment uh, uh, process, roughly how we build it and then how we, uh, how we track it. Yeah, I think I'd like to distinguish between assessment and accountability. Uh, I'd say we have a strong an ass assessment program, assessment of our students, assessment of our faculty, assessment of our program as any in the country. And I frankly don't think very much of the accountability movement. So I'll, I'll take those in order. Uh, the, Everybody needs to learn to be honest and candid with themselves. We all can do better. And we know that as students, we know that as faculty, uh, we know that as people who are working within our institution. And we're careful enough with one another that we can be candid about our own shortcomings. So we, we have a way of assessing students every semester, bringing each student in alone into the room with all of the, that student's teachers, five teachers in each semester. And the teachers talk about the student in the third person, as though the student were not in the room. And they assess the student in the mathematics tutorial, the language tutorial, the laboratory, the seminar. Uh, and they talk about it, and they learn from each other about that. And after 10, 12 minutes of discussion and all the short, shortfalls and failings and very good things, they then turn to the student and say, uh, have you got anything you'd like to add? Sometimes the student pulls out a laundry list. And sometimes the student thanks you and leaves it. Sometimes the student has to reach for the only prop we use, which is a box of Kleenex in the, in the room. We do similar things with our uh, assessment of faculty, very strong uh, reviews of the faculty, all done with personal interviews. We don't have student sheets that they fill out and you know, check in the numbers on each class. Every student is interviewed, or many students, depending on where they are in the, in the program, are interviewed for every faculty uh, appointment and reappointment decision, as well as all uh, tenured members of the faculty. Uh, and we have countless occasions for people teaching together so they watch one another. Of course, our classes are very small, so all of us know pretty well what the students are like. We have a big assessment at the end of the sophomore year where all the faculty gathers and talks about each student individually as though they actually have some understanding and knowledge of each of the students in the school. Uh, and they talk about whether those sophomores are capable of doing the upper division work. And that meeting will go from 7 in the evening until 12, 1 in the morning as we go through that list of students. Uh, and we do similar assessments uh, as they uh, go into their upper classes. Uh, all of the faculty is teaching across the program, and it means every year there's a different group of faculty teaching the math. Freshman math, sophomore math, junior language, and so on. And all of the teachers who are doing that, tutors, uh, have an archon or a leader. Uh, and that group does an assessment of the curriculum that they're teaching that year and the success that that had with the class. And then they bring in uh, suggestions for improvement to an instruction committee that meets all year, every week in which the school is in session from 1 o'clock to 4, 5, 6, 7 o'clock in the evening on Tuesday afternoons. I sit in on that. Uh, meeting is chaired by the dean and has six other members of the faculty elected to it. So th these, this kind of thing goes on and on within the college. It's constant assessment, and we think of assessment as a tool for learning. We don't separate the two, that we're assessing all the time as we're learning so we know what kind of devices we need to use in the classroom to help the learning proceed. Accountability in this country has come to mean something a little different, and that is how do you stack up your learning measures against other institutions as though you're each trying to measure the same kind of thing. Well, frankly, I think it's a race to the bottom of standards when one does that, and uh, I don't think it's a helpful uh, thing. I think it's, frankly, uh, a terrible waste of institutional effort to play that game. Um, we're not looking for a particular outcome for our students. When we talk about freedom to build a life, 
we want them to build that life. So even while we have tests and quizzes and things like that, they're supposed to master certain things as they go along, those are the tiny ends. Those are the little ends that don't matter. The, the big ends are ones that belong to them. And for us to say that a student ought to be this at the end of that class, or ought to have learned that, we think that's completely improper. And we imagine that most of our students learn very different things from the same books and the same classes. We think that's a good thing. Did you want to take Again, over? I would love to get some questions from the audience. So certainly this has been has provoked some thought. And um, would you like to say your name and who you are and then ask a question, please? Thank you, Judy. I want to thank the speakers for this thought-provoking evening. Uh, very, very interesting. My name is Joe Shadid. I'm an alumnus of, the, of this school. I'm also a professor of engineering at Wentworth Institute in Boston. You know, the 18-year-olds that are coming in, we're educating them for decades to come. They probably will not retire before the year 2060, 2070. And if we are to look at the 21st century as the century of, where, you know, the century of sustainability, where some of us think that education from this point on is probably education for, for sustainability. What do you think your model is with respect to education for sustainability? Um, You're talking to me now. Both of you, actually. Okay. Uh, well, there are a lot of things that one learns outside the classroom, but all of the books that we're speaking to are talking about things that I would think of as sustaining questions how one sustains a human community, how one sustains life on the planet. So these things come through the program of instruction, but we also try to set an example within our community uh, for sustainability concerns. So if we're talking about the environment as an example of sustainability, it means that you know we're building to lead standards. We have the largest wetlands restoration on the, in the United States on our campus. I can't believe it. that's the largest wetlands restoration. It's a <laughs> tiny 240 <laughs> feet. Um, but uh, with uh, geothermal heating and cooling and that sort of thing, we have student clubs that you know, help us with this and you know, push us and demand that we attend to these things. We have our, uh, all of our electrical power is supplied with credits for wind power and the like. So we try to set some examples of citizenship in the community. But I think the sustainability comes out of uh, the conversation with the, among the students that continues inside and out of the, uh, outside about any of these enduring questions that they're all going to have to face. They're going to go on and specialize. They're all going to go on into a world where they're going to have to learn much, much more about the technical side of things in order to, uh, to make that more real. Uh, we know that. And uh, we think that as long as they have the tools uh, to learn, they can, they can learn that uh, later. Yeah, I, I, I agree in, uh, in large part. The uh, University of Phoenix has been recognized as one of the, the top ten universities in the country for purchase and using uh, renewable energy. We have a large solar initiative. Uh, and we also have LEED certified um, facilities in, in several locations. We're in 40 states, so it's hard to go completely green all at once. But where I, where I agree substantially with my colleague is that in large part, this comes from uh, an ability to think critically, to understand ourselves and our place in the environment, which I think the solid liberal arts education uh, contributes to in, you know, in, in not just a significant way, in a crucial way that allows us to, to make those decisions going forward. So what I've talked a lot about is infrastructure as opposed to some, some of the meat that, that, that Chris has really gotten to. And I think it's the combination of those things that allow for sustainability going forward. Thank you. Hi. My name is Lauren Elmore. I'm a third year doctoral student at the Graduate School of Education. I'm concentrating in higher education. Uh, thank you both for coming to this and uh, stating very uh, thought provoking statements. Um, my question, I have two um, specific questions for each of you, but around the theme of 
um, knowledge, your definition of knowledge. So I wrote them down so I could be really concise. Um, for uh, Mr. Nelson Esquire, I thought you should have a title too. <laughs> um, with the growth of first generation students, which your colleague spoke to, um, the non-traditional student actually becoming the traditional student and the rising diversity of, the, of uh, the college population, college attending population, where do they fit in in the definition of what it means to be human when your definition that you stated was uh, heavily leaning toward Western and what we called an undergrad as an African-American studies major, like the old white men canon. Um, and then uh, for Dr. Pepicello, uh, your model relies heavily on uh, the trust that the students know what they need, know what they don't know and know how to go get it. However, you spoke about the fact that many of the students are first generation students who don't know how to navigate the airport. So how do you reconcile those two um, sounds like discrepancies? So thank you, I'll go sit down. Yeah, um, we have probably a, an education in something on the order of seven civilizations, by no means covering uh, all of human civilizations. And we think it would be a big mistake if we were uh, just uh, sampling uh, things from one civilization or another. We do have a program in Eastern classics <coughs> studying India, Japan, and China out of our Santa Fe campus at a graduate level because we think that's probably a very important thing that's not touched upon in the undergraduate program. We don't have room for it. Uh, but as for the other kinds of issues for first generation students, I don't think this curriculum is at all weak in that respect. Um, it is true that a lot of first generation students haven't had uh, experience in their families with the kinds of things that uh, they might be seeing in a liberal arts college and have been propelled by their communities to think only of how much more money they can earn when they go to college. But those that can see through and who are uh, anxious to learn, uh, read, big readers, those tend to be the students we attract, uh, they do extremely well irrespective of their socioeconomic background. And I suppose some proof of that is that over 20% of our students are Pell eligible uh, students, we do try to provide the financial means for all of our students to attend. We also have a fairly good complement of international students, and they help to bring uh, an education to our students by their very presence on the campus. Okay, uh, yes, to, to come to the point of students who don't know how to navigate the, uh, the airport, part of our responsibility is to, to teach them what an airport is about, and we have. Uh, several programs at the university, and I'll just, I'll talk about two of them very briefly. One is called University Orientation, <clears throat> and it's a, it's a three-week course that students with fewer than uh, 24 credits when they come to the university must take, and it's, it's at no cost, and it essentially addresses the, the, um, the areas that I talked about earlier. It addresses academic skills, affective, uh, the affective piece and the heuristic piece. And it's designed to let students who are first generation, who may not have uh, a solid grounding either in the academic or the, or, or the socioeconomic world, the chance to f discover what it's going to be like to come in to the airport and see whether or not they want to come into the airport, whether they might rather take a bus um, or, or an alternate type of transportation. Um, and should they decide they do want to come into the airport, we then have a first year sequence for these students that, that integrates life skills with academic skills. So we pair courses. For instance, we would pair a personal finance course with a writing course. So the students would be taking a course that they can, in personal finance, they can directly relate to their own life at the moment. And then in the writing course, they can actually write about what it is they're experiencing in that course so that we sort of ladder that type of, of educational experience so that as students go forward, we are in fact treating them holistically with the understanding that they have a, a set of, of, um, of support needs that go beyond strictly academic. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Julia Giddes. I'm a master's student here in a Federalist Front biped at the Harvard School of Education. 
Um, I have a lot of respect for both online learning as well as a classical liberal arts education, so hearing you both talk was really fascinating for me. Something I was hoping you could address um, that I didn't hear was the role of higher education in facilitating skills in leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm really curious how the two of you see both of your institutions in fostering some of those skills. Yeah, I, I think that a proper education and independence and self-sufficiency, the kinds of skills that I was trying to describe, uh, prepare you best for uh, entrepreneurial uh, enterprises. So when you ask, well, what do your students go on to do, it would look a lot like what the students would go on to do from any other of the major national liberal arts colleges, with one exception. Uh, very few of them go into middle management and into traditional business. An awful lot of them go into entrepreneurial pursuits, in particular high tech. Well, you didn't see me mention anything about IT and uh, technology, but an awful lot of the students come pretty well prepared with that and they learn it. But it's because they've got the curiosity and the desire uh, to make their living their own, not just to make their education their own. So I, I think there's a lot of excitement about moving around in their careers even. Um, if there's some virtue that they learn that maybe they learn too well is that they tend not to be afraid of anything. Not even Kant and Hegel. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, they will uh, go out thinking that they can master any of these other things. And that gives them that kind of entrepreneurial bent, even though we're not training them for a workforce in entrepreneurial things. Well, I have to agree completely because I'm the living proof. I don't have any business degrees. I never took a business course in my life. My undergraduate degree is in classics. My graduate degrees are in linguistics. And I get asked constantly, so how did you become the president of University of Phoenix? Yeah. And the answer is very simple. I had an outstanding undergraduate liberal arts education, which I then continued in graduate school. It gave me the ability to think critically, to see things from multiple perspectives. And, and frankly, I think that's, that, that's a real key to success. That said, certainly at University of Phoenix, we offer a, a variety of, of tracks in, in our business programs, well, in all of our programs that, that uh, apply both directly to leadership and to uh, entrepreneurism. For those students who sometimes don't have the, the advantage of that liberal arts background, but who have some experience, who, who, are, who are very intelligent, and who need that, that guidance to, to put them into that, you know, to take that next step. Um, and so we provide that framework for them to, to go in that direction. Good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Avakian. I'm a graduate student at Northeastern University focusing on, on for-profit higher education. So I'm very excited about this tonight. Um, I'm also an instructor in the College Student Development Master's Program there, preparing uh, future staff for the colleges and universities. Uh, Many of the roles include uh, working at student activities and in residential life. Um, my understanding of the role of higher education in the United States is in part workforce development and in part preparing citizens for participation in our democracy. And it is my belief that many of the skills and lessons learned happen outside the classroom, something that hasn't really been talked about here much tonight. Um, and my concern is that as higher, for profit higher education, the primary online model that it uses captures a larger percentage of, of the market, um, as you would say, um, students miss out on those opportunities to participate, whether it's um, being engaged in a student government, writing for a campus newspaper, or simply living next door to someone unlike them um, at, at 18 years old. And so I have a concern for what our students are going to graduate um, and how, you know, you think about you know, Robert Putnam's work in bowling alone. My concern is that they'll all be playing you know, we bowling alone in front of their monitors, um, not even going out to go bowling. So I'm wondering what you think about uh, these changes. Sure. If our student were an 18-year-old who just came out of high school, I would share your concerns. Our students, by and large, are people who already have a rich social, so social network, a social experience. Um, our, our students are, frankly, not concerned with student governance, they are concerned with being members of their church, being active in the community. They already have those aspects in their lives. So what we try to do is provide uh, the opportunity for them to take what they learn in our programs, including our, uh, our liberal arts programs, which are, are now small but growing, um, so they can take that back to that experience and enrich it. 
because we're not really, um, we, we, don't, we don't provide that part of their lives. They come to us with that, and what we try to do is, is enrich it as, as opposed to really develop it in a, in a more fundamental way. See if I can suggest right. we're starting to run a little right. late, so we should probably just say that the three folks who are at the right. mic now would be our last uh, Absolutely. question. Absolutely, and, and one question each. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeff Berger. I had the privilege long ago of uh, taking the program at St. John's. And um, uh, I consider it to be uh, a programming in the superior minds of, of the Western world. Uh, it, but if you, my question is about that word, program. Because edu all education is programming. Everybody knows that. But the history of philosophy is the history of the pursuit of of freedom of thought, as uh, Mr. Nelson was alluding to. And um, my question is, do Shakespeare and Nietzsche and Plato, as the superior minds, uh, have everything there is to say about what we know to be uh, a shift in, since at least the 60s counterculture, toward technology as a, a means of autodidacticism, as sort of a um, a type of psychic fragmentation. And are these minds even, I mean, as a foundational education, it's ideal, but moving forward to address the shift into technology, is there some kind of like uh, ad adaptation of the program? I imagine there will be adaptation. There's been quite a bit. Shakespeare wasn't introduced to the college until 1886. Uh, I just read that. I couldn't tell you that about another book. But um, uh, we're always adapting, and we're adapting very slowly because all of the books speak to one another, and whatever we put into the program means we've got to take something out. So we can't just keep adding courses because we don't have any courses. So I'm sure that slowly but surely, as we have the last 73 years, we will continue to adapt, and there'll probably be uh, more work in uh, artificial intelligence, just as there is a whole lot more work in molecular biology today than when you and I were students at the college. Um, so, I mean, that's one answer. The other is, we can't do everything. And so you're right, that we're, we're looking for a foundation uh, in education. And we know that about 70% of our students will go on at some point to other graduate or professional work. We know that they're going to be well prepared to undertake serious specialization, and we know from experience that they're moving into a world uh, where they are experimenting, where they're, they're going into these new fields, they're not afraid of them, and so we take some comfort that the, that the foundations are working for that, even though we're not addressing those questions directly. Hi, I'm Jade Cohen. I'm a master's student here at the School of Ed, and I have a question about the University of Phoenix. Um, I wondered if you could say a few words about um, the relation of, of the university to um, the open university and to non-degree granting approaches like, um, like MIT's open courseware. Sure. Um, well, we have no direct correlation to open university. Um, certainly, some of the, I think some of the underlying concepts are similar. Um, I th one of the things that, that may be true is that open university had less success in the United States than it's had uh, in its homeland. And conversely, we've had less success when we tried to take the university per se international um, than, than we have had here. So I think it's, it's a matter of looking at the, uh, the grounding of, uh, uh, well, the cultural grounding of, the, of those two and, and how the students that, uh, that are drawn to one or the other have some, I think, a, a basic cultural distinction there. And as far as non-degree um, uh, sorts of things, it, we have not traditionally uh, done much in the way of, of non-degree or continuing education. It's something we, we continue to look at. Um, the, the struggle now is that, in particular with non-degree or certificate learning, those, the, the, the programs that we would put in place to address the, the needs are in jobs that we don't know yet. 
for, we know that there, there's going to be a need for certification, let's say, in sustainability. We know there are going to be developing needs in IT. We, we do constant research to try to find out what those needs will be so that we can have the right kind of education, whether it's non-degree um, or degree. The struggle is that we don't know what those jobs are going to, are going to look like yet. However, in, in some aspects of higher education, I think it's, it's, it may be the case going forward that there may be cases in which non-degree education will replace some things now that we require full degrees for. Hi. <laughs> My name is Shou. Uh, I'm a Harvard Extension uh, uh, student, still working on my undergraduate degree. Uh, I'm 30 years old. And, and I go back and forth from Japan and here to uh, pursue my degree. So, but when, uh, partial liberals. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I visited both St. John's College, uh, Annapolis, and uh, New Mexico. And then I was dead set on uh, going to that college. But then uh, my family situation and then uh, life got in, get in the way. I went back to Japan, went to university in Japan, and and didn't really work hard. Dropped out. Uh, IT fever started working, and ten years, and and so so yeah, become disorganized. And and I'm wondering. And and today, University of Phoenix, like the course catalogs and uh, uh, management science, or the uh, those business marketable uh, classes are really appealing to me to get a a job. At work and and I'm wondering if University of Phoenix can offer something that St. John's can offer, like something more liberal artsy, or and if St. John's can offer uh, something in uh, classes in innovative way, so that that uh, and for me the best compromise is Harvard Extension at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Good save at the end there. <laughs> Bringing it all together. Um, who wants to take that? You know, our, our dean transferred from Harvard to St. John's College. Uh, I, I don't know. We, we're working with alumni to bring uh, something online. Doesn't seem to work as well because so much is, requires that personal attention, that small classroom, that spontaneous activity. Uh, on the other hand, I'm up here in part to set up a an executive seminar in Boston uh, with people in town that uh, would love to pursue this reading on a <coughs> monthly basis. And I do this in cities across the country. And we have students in those programs, so it's possible that there should be something up here in Boston one of these days. Uh, but I don't, I don't know how, we, how we're going to do this online. We've tried many different things, and uh, so far we're not satisfied with them. Pardon me? Yeah, we have one part-time student. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. <clears throat> well, I, I, probably there's, there's nothing that St. John's do that we could do nearly as well. Um, and I'm, I'm very envious of my colleague because coming from that background, uh, I, I, I truly do understand the value of it. Uh, given that, at University of Phoenix, and this goes back to one of the, uh, the points I made about leveling the playing field for for-profit, because of the way the uh, uh, United States Department of Education categorizes for-profit institutions, I could offer a, a, an array of liberal arts programs, but until this year, they were not eligible for financial aid because all four profits were categorized as VOTEC schools. Uh, with the removal of that restriction, we now have a very limited liberal arts um, offerings that are tied to our education programs because we still have to show how whatever we offer leads to a, uh, to a career. As you can imagine, that frustrates me primarily because if someone were to ask me how my degrees led to my current a situation, it, it would be a, uh, a rather interesting story. So we hope someday to, to have a fuller array, um, but certainly we'll never be able to, uh, to come to the level of St. John's. 
Christie has one final comment. Yeah, one other thought, and it's particularly interesting for people who are going into education. We do have a graduate institute, and that's where we have flexibility. We have uh, opportunities for study in the summer, and people, teachers come from around the country to study at St. John's so they can get this experience with the books in an eight-week intensive course. And people who are working professionals uh, who might otherwise be taking University of Phoenix courses in the evenings and all that can come during the uh, academic year uh, and study on Monday and Thursday nights and take a course over the uh, course of a couple of years to get a master's degree. And one doesn't have to go from semester to semester to semester. These can be accumulated over many years so that there's there is an opportunity at the graduate level. And you get much the same kind of program uh, as we try to do with the undergraduates. This, yeah, I think we're both just wanting to thank well, our two presidents. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to add the thought that you can imagine when we, when we conceived this uh, evening and framed it, it was difficult to figure out exactly how to state it because did we want to say that we were inviting you know, uh, an, an American gladiator meets Ameri uh, higher education where they're kind of mud wrestling about uh, various ideas or a more dignified kind of debate. We were a little worried, uh, maybe in fact they'd agree on almost everything and there wouldn't actually be um, sparks. So I'm just so grateful that both of you were both so candid in, in, in expressing a real clear line of thought, which I think we could all hear many, many differences in, lots of things to go off and, and think about, and yet lots of, of stuff to respect in both uh, models that you, you presented. So thank you for sharing so much of us from, from your separate perspectives and not being shy about it. And thank you all for coming. Please join us and thank you all for